Caddis Maximus here again. There was uh, some interest actually generated in this desoldering tool, this Denon Instruments Corporation SC-7000. I call it the cow gun. Uh, but there was a, actually a specific person, Mr. Cruz, asked if I could do a disassembly video just so that people could see what was inside and maybe have a little more confidence. And I've actually been inside this before and figured uh, it's a good thing to do. I kind of like taking stuff apart and showing people. So I'm going to do that real fast in a video here, the disassembly of the Denon SC-7000. Uh, I don't think I'm going to be like Abe. I'm not going to take this down to every constituent little piece because particularly the pump um, has a lot of small parts associated with it. Not a lot, but there's enough of them and it becomes a hassle. So we'll see how far I go. But as far as general disassembly procedures, obviously you want to make sure that this unit is unplugged. As shown here, not plugged in. That's always the first thing that you do with one of these tools. The second thing is you want to eject the cartridge. You don't really want to have that in there. And I don't know if I mentioned before, but these cartridges can be reused. You can just get in there, pull out the filter and poke and scrape out the uh, solder that builds up. They do charge a little bit of money to replace these cartridges and they're kind of hard to find. The filter does get filled up, but what I found is I use, you go get the little tiny Dremel cotton buffing wheels. And uh, those are great to stuff in there because they're high density cotton like this, like what they use in here. And that's a great way to replace the filter that's inside it. As far as this assembly, you'll want to remove the three screws that hold the front of the tool on or that holds the heat shield and keeps the uh, heating element steady. And those screws are what kind of hold the two case halves together. Although technically, I believe you could get away with just removing this one on the left hand or passenger side of the uh, tool. And we'll actually see about that. It actually appears so that you can just remove this one screw that's on the left hand side when held in a normal operating position. You'll just pull out that screw and then there are three screws around the body. This is a nice little unit where they use integrated uh, nuts through through nuts in the plastic rather than just being screwed into the plastic we're using a number two Phillips good old standard number two and we'll just remove those three screws well we'll loosen them up here and then we'll extract them with a little magnet there we go let me get a little magnet here's a magnet this is makes it much easier just to pull those little screws out And that's really all there is to it. And yes, it, indeed it does look like you can pull it apart. I'm just a little worried about this little setup here. I'm not exactly sure how that comes apart. Oop, the little nuts fell out, so they're not really held in very securely. You want to make sure not to use the, lose those little nuts. They're very fine thread and kind of difficult to get a hold of. Now, the tricky part is actually getting these little case halves apart. There we go. It kind of just slides a little bit over that. There's just enough of a gap to get that little switch to fit through the hole in the casing. And it just pops open like so. And there we have the inside of this unit. It's actually surprisingly a bit more complicated. If you look online, these tools are actually pretty darn expensive. We had a big old glob booger of solder that got caught in the back of that. So you'll want to make sure that that doesn't happen where the solder is building up inside there. There's our two, well, let's get a little bit of a zoom so we can actually see here. Here we are, there's our wires that go to the heating element. And we can actually see right there, 100 volt to 120 volt, and it probably says, and there's actually some part numbers, A2551. So that would be for the heating element. It says, relatively standard uh, hollow element so I'm sure that it can be found even not from the actual manufacturer. We can see inside here the little activation switch and what is nice is that they soldered the connections. They did not crimp them and it is a nice little micro switch rated at 5 amps 250 volts AC so definitely uh, well above what it's what's necessary. There is another comment about the bottom portion getting really hot. Now I never noticed that and I guess I didn't remember, but there is a large resistor. I assume that's associated with driving the motor, although I'm uh, not entirely sure. It could also be related to the heat control electronics here. We can see uh, how these electronics work. It has, or 
the basics of how it works. Since we have a big MOSFET transistor, what it's actually doing is turning on, using that to control the heating element, gets to a certain point, and then electronically turns it on and off. There's our indicator light. And then this would actually be a little calibration uh, adjustment, potentiometer with a little bit of glue on it. So you can use, like, a, I would use a direct contact thermometer. Uh, rather than like an infrared non-contact heat gun. And you can actually measure the temperature of this tip related to what temperature you have it set to on the back. And if you find that it's too high or too low, say you have it set at 350 and it's reading at uh, 375 there, then you could just adjust this down until you can recalibrate it. So that's one nice feature of a more professional unit. It does have this in a nice kind of rubberized uh, holder that goes inside the plastic so it's pretty well secured as well as these rubber boots here which hold the, the pump mechanism and this switch which converts the pump from both being uh, vacuum to hot air blowing. Now that's one thing I did mention is this is a little tool and it does not work quite as well as a uh, surface mount desoldering tool just because it just has such a tiny little jet although it does work I mean it's not false advertising it's just more designed to use pr produce a vacuum rather than a nice pressurized stream we can see other nice features where they have a flexible hose for the uh, vacuum but they put in a spring to keep that hose from getting kinked so it has a good amount of flow so that is a nice aspect we can see that the pump in this unit is surprisingly high quality. We, it is not, even though it is plastic, not, it is using nice screws, and those screws are actually held in to little brass inserts into the back piece of the plastic. They don't put brass inserts in the cheap style tools. We can also see the little pump arm, which is just a motor connected to a crankshaft. And surprisingly enough, it appears to be counterweighted because there's a big old screw. They wouldn't use a screw that size uh, for no reason, especially when there's an additional set screw. So I assume that is actually a counterweight for uh, the mechanism in there. We can also see that it is brass. Now, I did inspect closely up into there, and there's actually a tiny uh, metal shielded ball bearing like what would be in a ball bearing computer fan a very small bearing but it is surprising that is a ball bearing up in that uh, crankshaft there crankshaft to rod connection that'd be the big end of the rod I suppose discovering something else in here I always thought there's a separate spring when that pushes this forward but no it's just the spring that's inside the hose itself so whenever you're shutting this you got to make sure that it's shut uh, you manually push it forward that does appear to be a DC motor that they're rectifying to be run off of AC. But I'm trying to find down here in the bottom uh, any evidence of said rectification, something to a diode or something like that. Anyway, I kind of lost track there. To that person, when you open this up, you know, see what's getting hot down here. See if it's this big resistor. That's a huge resistor. That would be on the order of three to five watts to have a resistor like that and that would generate some heat. I've never had much heat with my tool but if you have quite a bit of heat with yours that's one place I'd check. We can also see where the wires are wrapping around and maybe caught maybe chafed and you could possibly have a short so that's some of the things that I would check um, but if you have heat down the handle then this is the place where it's going to be happening is this power input board and it actually appears that this whole mechanism pops out relatively easily you don't want to forget the wiring path that's running up along the back of the tool and going up under the motor here motor and pump assembly i should say we'll take a look at this motor it also has a nice boot at the bottom so uh rubberized boot so uh, it keeps vibration down quite a bit so now we can take a look at the motor itself and it might be hard to see somebody who knows more about motors than I do, but there's definitely some circuitry that isn't standard. It is a DC permanent magnet motor, but we've got a couple of coils, like little uh, inductors in there, as well as what looks like a capacitor, so noise filtering circuitry. But I'm still having trouble determining where exactly the diode is that's making this little uh, brush-type DC motor operate. It does, have, it does not have any fan, but it does have some pretty large brushes in it. It's designed to last quite a while. Let me get a flashlight. There we go. We might get a better look there. There's the brushes. They're actually pretty darn large. Uh, and surprisingly enough, the windows are right over the tops of the brushes. So it may just be possible to replace them, but it would be a task, a very delicate task indeed. 
This motor does use bronze bushing, so it is not a ball bearing motor, but it's still plenty good enough that they use a ball bearing up in the most important part. We can see that it's a diaphragm type vacuum pump. So if it ever seems to operate and you lose vacuum, it's going to be an issue either with the diaphragm or the little valves. The valves in this pump are going to be what's known as reed valves, which are just little sheet pieces of sheet metal that sit over the top of a hole, uh, kind of like cheap oilless air compressors. So the it, the motor may actually, even though it's coming off this board, there may this board down here. It looks like there is some wire, wiring that runs up to the temperature controller and then back down because not only does the temperature controller have a MOSFET, there's a couple of diodes I can see under the wheel. And then this round circuit right here, if we can just get the right angle on it, see how it's a little wave and then a plus and a minus. So that's going to be a bridge rectifier that's in there. And even a tiny little bridge rectifier like that can handle uh, several amps. So there is a few electronics in here that, you know, some may not be repairable, but things like the motor, you can end up finding can motors like this online because they all use specific types of sizing or from Denon directly. You know, the most likely thing to fail is after heavy use, I'm sure would be some part of the pumping mechanism that has this integrated switch. If somebody really wants to, I'll uh, make a video about that. But this is just kind of a disassembly and reassembly just to... So somebody isn't too scared to go inside uh, and has some kind of reference. When you do reassemble it, any product that has these kind of rubberized boots, you really got to make sure that they're properly seated. And they all have like these little channels cut out in the plastic. So you want to make sure everything is uh, pretty well situated. It has these little cups. They fit in these little circular cutouts. So you want to make sure all those get fitted uh, nice and proper. I'm actually going to semi-reassemble this here. I'll zoom out a little bit and then I'll actually give it a little run just so you can see how the little pump working inside. We'll go ahead and stuff that in there. We'll go ahead and finagle this pump back in there. This little thing has a cutout for the wiring. We'll kind of have to push the wiring down as we get the motor in there. This part here I can already see I'm getting caught up and I'm not far enough down. It is a tight fit. That boot really needs to be pressed on uh, there. See, I haven't got it on all the way. If it doesn't want to fit down in there, you really just got to make sure that that boot is all the way seated on the motor. Now that fell into place just fine. And sorry I'm so loud. I'm right next to the mic on the phone there. And then that actually kind of all sat in there real nice. Take this wire and make sure that it's pushed down properly back into that little groove in there. Not too hard, it just kind of rides just like that. I really like this Denon unit because they, like on some of these hotter resistors, they use the insulated, uh, fiberglass insulated uh, wire protection. And along these wires up through here, it has fiberglass protection. There's our little green ground wire actually going up to the metallic portion of the tip. So it is a well-built unit. You know, there's a lot of complicated little parts in this. And so for one of these to be $300 really doesn't seem that bad because... Uh, of just all the different things that are involved. They do have a cutout. There's a little flange on the back of this rubberized part that holds this control board. And they have a little cutout for the wires, but they don't fit through. So that doesn't have to be perfect. Even from the factory, the wires didn't go through. So if that's folded out a little bit, that's not an issue. You just want to make sure that this motor is seated nice and solid in there. I'm going to go ahead and plug it in just so you can see the little crankshaft uh, spin around. You need to be extremely careful whenever you're working on a piece of electronics where you have to have it open in order to do some testing while it's plugged in. Super duper careful. Really be careful. One hand only. The reason that they say when working on live electrical components to use one hand is the big danger is not just getting a shock or a spark happening. But if you have some current go from one hand through your chest to another hand, that means the electrical power is going through your heart. That's where it gets real dangerous. So if you only have one hand touching something, you can't complete a circuit through your chest, which significantly increases the hazard of uh, an electrical discharge in your body. A 9-volt battery has more than enough power to kill you. Easily. If you had a low enough resistance, you could die from a 9-volt battery. People don't believe that, but it's no joke. It's some 50, 50 milliamps, point. Zero five amps is all it takes to cause a heart arrhythmia. I mean, it's a big deal. The heart is surprisingly electrically sensitive. So we got that all together. We're going to carefully turn on the little power switch. 
we're going to be real careful here. We're going to hold it. And I did just get close with two hands. I should not have done that. There we go. Now we can just watch the little crankshaft go. Why are we not working? Let me unplug it for a second here. I have it unplugged. There's this circuit board actually has two little slots and then there's like a post here with a slot in it. I did not have that in there properly. So you want to make sure that's properly attached or slid into its little cartridge area, I should say. Make sure this is back down and seated before I plug this back in. There we go. And so when this thing operates, and that's why I call it the cow gun. It kind of sounds like it's mooing when you operate it. But it is actually a really smooth running. That counterweight is was a great idea. Anyway, that was just the end of this video. It was a little bit long, but I, a viewer had requested it, and I had never done a what's inside video, so kind of doing two birds with one stone here. Anyway, I really appreciate everybody watching and subscribing, and if you haven't subscribed, please do. Caddis Maximus out.